Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Best of Pedal Shift. On this edition, we go all the way back to January 2017. Yes, six years ago for the Pedal Shift Project 067. You know, back in the day, if you've only recently picked up the pod, back in the day, I used to do hodgepodge episodes, episodes where I covered all sorts of crazy things all at once. Uh, And this was definitely one of them. On this particular episode, we did a follow-up on uh, bike touring stove tests, an overview on intermittent fasting for those of us who, and this, by the way, is a repeat here in 2023, maybe put on a few pounds (laughs) and we're trying to get them off. Intermittent fasting is a tool for that, Uh, plus some counterintuitive advice on keeping your feet warm on tour, plus a whole bunch of other things. This is kind of a cool hodgepodge episode from six years ago. It's crazy. We'll have some really fun best ofs coming up this year. And of course, we've got some great content coming at you this winter as well. Hope you enjoy. The Journal is the part of the show where we talk about things impacting tours, whether they're your tours or mine. It's a January podcast, so it is now my great, 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 um, uh, shall I say pleasure? I won't say pleasure. Basically, every year you hear me do a January show and lament at the fact that I've gained more weight than I would have liked during the sort of beginning of the uh, non-touring season and through the holidays. And so my typical post-touring season weight gain has once again reared its ugly head. So I like to talk about it on the show. I feel like this is the third consecutive year. This is also probably the third consecutive year that I've said, and this time I'm keeping it off for good. Um, I need to drop probably about 20 pounds again before touring season begins. It, it's just better for me in terms of just all of my stuff myself up hills. Um, it, it's just a lot easier when you're like that. I would, as I said, like to make it a little more permanent this time. So in the past couple of years, I've talked about just, you know, my basic tips on calorie restriction and eating and all of that other kind of good stuff. This year, I'm trying something a little bit different. And, and it's been part and parcel with some conversations I've had with Mysterious James about intermittent fasting. And I think I want to say at the outset of this that anytime I talk about bicycle touring generally, but um, especially when it comes to health related stuff, make sure you're following good advice of your doctor if you've got one and you're consulting with one uh, before doing any kind of touring activity. But when you're talking about kind of health and eating and stuff like that, make double sure that you aren't doing something crazy and consult with actual professionals as opposed to this guy who you don't really know on the other side of a microphone on a podcast. That would be a good idea. I At the outset, I've said the term intermittent fasting. I'm going to say this before I even get into it. I do not recommend that you do intermittent fasting while on tour. I, I think that actually could be dangerous if it's timed wrong. Um, and I think also that intermittent fasting isn't going to be something that would be good for everyone. So definitely chat with your doctor. Folks who are younger and still developing, pregnant women, all sorts of folks should not be doing this. Um, if you're not in that boat, then maybe it's something that could work for you. Um, let me let me talk a little bit about what intermittent fasting is. I'm combining my usual kind of calorie restriction with regular periods of fasting. And the reason why I'm doing that is that there are a bunch of studies that have been coming out in recent years, and, and actually they go back quite a bit too, that show that it's a good thing for a variety of types of things beyond just weight loss. It's kind of a great time for your body to get into kind of a healing mode, and it does a variety of other things. If you want sort of a good basic overview, I'd recommend the BBC documentary, check, uh, what's it called? Eat Fast and Live Longer, and I've got a link in the show notes to that. I think it's a really good overview of the science behind it, and there's, of course, also all sorts of different ways that you can kind of do a deep dive into the reports and the science on it. If that's of interest to you and you've got the Google machine for that, so you don't need some dopey guy on a podcast to talk about that. I am going to talk a little bit about the two different methods that I am considering for sort of my take on this. And again, this is partially about weight loss, but I'm also looking at it as a larger health exercise as well and also a way to sort of get prepared for touring season while I'm largely off the bike in terms of long distance stuff. I'm still on the bike on a fairly regular basis. Um, DC is bad weather, but not so much so this year, but I'm on the bike a lot, but just not in the same way. So this is a good way for me to kind of get things back into gear again. 
So the first way that one could do intermittent fasting is by doing something that's called the 5-2 method. You sometimes will see things called the 5-2 diet and all sorts of other things like that. This is uh, one of the more simple ways of doing it. And the two ways I'm going to talk about are fairly simple. Five days on and two days off. Uh, five days of, of feeding mode and two days of fasting mode. And those are kind of the modes that you get, feeding and fasting. Um, the, the five days that are feeding days are essentially you eat kind of at a normal caloric level. So for men, that's usually around 2,000 calories. For women, it can vary. It's usually a little bit less, 1,800, 1,900, something along those lines. On your fasting days, for those two that you do in the week, uh, you don't do them consecutively, by the way. You eat at 25% of that. So for men, you're looking at anywhere between five and 600 calories. Women are somewhere in the 500 calorie range right there. And uh, what a lot of the science has shown is that you get all the benefits of the fasting in a way that's a little bit more maintainable. Um, 500 or 600 calories in a day is a very small amount compared to what most people eat, of course, but it's manageable. And um, what most people's experience that I've seen uh, have been is that, well, yeah, you get hungry, but it's a manageable amount. And the good news is that you know that the next day you're going to be able to eat normal. So it's not this lengthy, protracted period of deprivation that so many calorie restriction diets create and then therefore create a eh, method of maybe not being able to stick with it. So that's the 5-2 method. The other is the 18-6 method, and this one's a daily way, a daily approach, and that is 18 hours of fasting and six hours of feeding. And the way that works is it's as simple as basically kind of setting it by a clock and just sticking with this every day. So an 18-6 person would maybe start their eating day at noon and it will end at 8 p.m. And in between, of course, you're asleep for a good chunk of that time. But then when you wake up in the morning, it's a breakfast skip. And then you do all of your calorie eating between the hours of, say, 12 and 8. Now, of course, you can shift that around. You can do 1 and 7 or the other direction, whatever sort of fits your lifestyle and maybe your sleeping habits as well. And the uh, interesting thing about that is most people, at least what I've read and kind of consumed online, find this to be the easiest way to at least get started with it. So that's actually something that I've started doing myself. I have combined the calorie restriction levels that I was uh, originally doing and, and doing based on an app that I've talked about. I use an app called Lose It, and uh, it works out pretty well. And by uh, sticking with that just within these fasting and feeding windows, um, I'm finding that it's working out pretty well and my results have been quite good so far. I have not, um, I've had some very good results from the weight loss perspective. I'm down, I think, seven pounds since I started um, after I got back from New York. So we're talking the second week of January, basically. So I've only been at this for maybe about a week and a half. And that's a lot of weight to lose. But I tend to lose weight when I do calorie restriction pretty rapidly at the outset. But um, this is more rapid than normal for me. It still feels like it's in a healthy space. So that's that's good. I haven't had any issues with hunger. And one thing that I've been surprised at during the, the feeding time is how difficult it is to actually jam all of those calories within your feeding window. Um, it's a six hour window. And even though I'm reducing the amount of calories that I'm actually eating in a given day compared to what I was doing before, trust me on that, um, it, it still kind of uh, find myself, oh, it's almost eight o'clock, so I should probably have this, that, and the other thing. Um, my dinners are very healthy, large dinners as opposed to when I was just doing calorie restriction where I was finding at the end of my day. I only had a few hundred calories left and it was sort of a meager kind of dinner. Now, I'm, I, I, it, because you essentially sort of skip the breakfast meal, things end up jamming all together. So everything works out fine. I have been a fan of uh, having a, a reduced breakfast early in the day during this kind of stuff. I've talked about, uh, you probably heard of Bulletproof Coffee or MCT Coffee. There's all sorts of names for it. It's basically butter coffee or butter and coconut oil. 
that is something that I've been doing for quite a few years and I really enjoy it. And I actually do it year round, but I think that that is something that has sort of trained my body to be able to do this morning fasting thing. And, uh, it has been a really kind of easy transition for me. So anyways, this has been a really lengthy diatribe on all of this. And I think it's useful in the sense that, um, if you find yourself in my position, uh, which is you are looking to maybe lose a little weight not while bike touring, this is something that you might want to do some research on and experiment with. I know I'm doing it, and it's uh, been really interesting so far. So I will uh, let you know a little bit more about the results as we go through the rest of this winter. But um, so far, so good, and I'm kind of interested in all of this. Um, I'm going to reiter- reiterate one more time to link this back to bicycle touring. This would be a tremendously bad idea to do while on tour, I think. Um, our caloric needs can often be substantially higher on tour. I probably don't need to tell that to people. Um, I did a quick little calculation for someone that's in my weight range that's doing just a very slow tour between 10 and 12 miles per hour. You know, if you're cycling for six hours, you're burning about 3,500 calories right there just doing that. And your resting state is another 2,000. So if you're on tour, you need to be eating somewhere above 5,000 calories just to sort of be uh, on on track with everything. So I think rotating in a, a long fast as a part of all of this, especially if you're going to be biking for a lot of the day, probably is a terrible idea uh, and certainly not something that I'm going to be interested in doing. And again, I also want to say this is not a good idea for folks who are in the categories of young, pregnant women, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you chat with medical professionals before you tackle anything like this. You can tell I'm a lawyer, right? Next up on the show is Gear Talk, and we've got all sorts of stuff. As promised last episode, we've got a Pedal Shift Society member, Brian Wren, clocking in here on some stove tests. And so uh, I've got a link in the show notes, or excuse me, a, a picture in the show notes of two of the stoves that he is working on. And I think that these are really, really helpful. One of them is an Optimus Sevilla and what he calls a cheap eBay burner for the ubiquitous canisters. Uh, he said that both of them boil the uh, requisite amount of water. He was boiling 16 ounces of water in under four minutes. And he said that uh, both weigh in around the same when full of fuel, about 20 ounces. And it it ends up working out about the same. Uh, Brian likes the alcohol option compared to the Svea, just for the fact that if he ever spills anything, he doesn't have to worry about it contaminating the environment. Alcohol is obviously a greener fuel in that sense. Um, and the same thing is true of the eBay burner, which uses a sealed canister. Now, one thing that I'll say is when I took a quick look at the eBay uh, stove, and of course, he's talked about this for the last couple of weeks, um, I noticed that it contained a very similar orange canister or orange uh, uh, storage area, a storage container for the stove. And as I looked a little bit cl- closer, his quote unquote eBay burner is the exact same E-Tech City uh, stove that I have been talking about all along here. So he's been testing the stove that I've been wanting to use and have been using for a while now and have recommended. I mean, th- I, I think, as I mentioned, you can get them for under 10 bucks on uh, 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 Amazon. So you've got that. And so as a result, I would say that this is a good test of that E-Tech City stove comparing to all of the other ones as well. Um, go look at past episodes of the Pedal Shift Project for all of Brian's tests. I think I'm leaning more and more towards uh, continuing to use this um, small foldable E-Tech City stove because it's got some great combinations of ease of use and portability. I think the only question ends up being your access to those fuel canisters, especially if you're traveling, because of course you can't fly with them. I've talked about this on the show before, but go check out the show notes. That's pedalshift.net slash 067 for more on that. Um, Good stuff. Thanks again, Brian, for doing all these tests for us. This is really fantastic. Next up in Gear Talk, I've got some counterintuitive advice. We've got a Pedal Shift Society member Seth Krieger writing in, and he writes, A randonneur friend of mine had already convinced me of the counterintuitive wisdom of sandals for riding in the rain. That's right, sandals. In wet conditions, there is no chance of ending up with shoes full of water. Less obvious is that sandals work well in cold as well because you can easily add layers without fear of running out of room in your shoe. After my experience on the Tugwata... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay, here we go, Seth. The Tugwoti... 
Tagwodi Pass. We're going to call it the Tagwodi Pass. <laughs> More recently, I have worn two layers of socks under the seal skins with my Shimano biking sandals in cold, rainy conditions in Washington, Idaho, and Scotland, and my feet stayed nice and toasty. Hands were more of a challenge, but for cold, I have found that the thin Smartwell gloves under Thinsulate half-finger convertible gloves and mittens work very well, and he's got a link uh, to those from Amazon. Uh, he continues to write, In all but a drenching downpour, these do the trick, as they shed lighter rain pretty effectively, and you can easily pull the mitten part back on for the use of your fingers. Only issue with them is that the finger openings on this particular brand are fairly tight, so I should have bought a size larger than I did. Um, he's tried neoprene gloves and found them to be ineffective and uh, ends up having his hands drowning in sweat. So that's uh, Pedal Chef Society member Seth Krieger. Seth, thank you so much. And my apologies for having a problem with Tagwodi Pass and the pronunciation of that. But that is part of the show. It seems my inability to pronounce things, including the word pronounce. Um, I think that the counterintuitive advice about sandals is really intriguing. I, I do think that the real key there, as you note, is you can layer up, and that's really important, but you're also going to want to make triple sure that you've got a windbreak on your feet. So if you've got some kind of a windproof sock layer, I think that that would really be a great idea. I've got a pair of Showers Pass socks that I think would do the trick, and that might be something that I consider trying out during some of the spring riding that I'm going to be doing, especially if I hit some wet and cold conditions. I think during the winter, it might be a lot trickier to keep your feet warm that way. But um, I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by that. And randonneur certainly no adverse conditions. So your randonneur friend is definitely a pro in this particular subject matter. So some counterintuitive advice from Seth about keeping your hands and feet warm. And of course, you can go back to past episode of the Pedal Shift Project where we talked more about that. So thanks, Seth, for writing in with that. Next up in gear talk, we're going to close it all out with the Gotenna. This just came across my radar recently. And I believe that over on the Sprocket podcast, they've mentioned another product that does a similar thing. So it strikes me that there, is, there are products that are hitting the market that fit the need for connectivity when you don't have a cell phone signal. And I think that this works really well uh, for people who are traveling in groups and want to stay connected, knowing that there is a chance of being uh pulled apart in some way, folks who are faster than others, any of those kinds of combinations of things. So what I've noticed in my riding is that very frequently I will rely solely on my cell phone and on parts of the Oregon coast or maybe maybe more on the California coast. Um, my uh, cell phone plan of choice is AT&T. There are terrible, terrible spots for AT&T all up and down the California coast. So if I was riding with somebody and they had, say, Verizon and were able to still get connectivity and I didn't, I wouldn't be able to get in touch with them by, by a text or by a call. So now there are all these different products that are essentially radio transmitters that work with your cell phone and they're cross-platform. They work with either uh, iOS or with Android. And what they essentially do is they use a long wave radio to communicate using specific apps on both platforms. And it works really well. Some of them are even using mesh networking. So if you've got somebody who's in the middle and somebody who's way ahead of you, who would ordinarily be out of range, you could actually still send to that out of what that person who would be ordinarily out of range because it basically transfers on the mesh network with the person who's in the middle. Um, I found a new product or a new company. It's called Gotenna. You can go check them out at gotenna.com. I haven't tried them out. I haven't tried any of these out, but I'm just kind of intrigued with them. Um, and this one is uh, sort of follows the same idea. You basically have it connected by Bluetooth to your phone. You want to keep it relatively close to your phone. Just because the further away Bluetooth, it doesn't, it, it's less reliable. But then it does the transmission between the various Go tennis. So you buy them in pairs or in fours. So just for instance, let's say that if Mysterious James and I went off on a, a West Coast ride or uh, something along those lines, you know, this would be a good potential product for us to stay in touch. Um, I can think of one particular ride, um, and I've talked about it on past shows, where we, well, we get separated all the time, but I remember one ride where actually uh, I had a tire blow up on the Great Allegheny Passage, and I had no way of getting in touch with him. Now, of course, James never has his freaking phone on anyways, but hypothetically, if he did have his phone on, 
Despite the fact that neither one of us would have had cell phone coverage in that area, this type of product would have allowed me to message him uh, up to four miles away, which is actually pretty pretty good, I think. I'm sure it's less in mountainous terrain, and of course the uh, folks at Gotenna and uh, all these other products say, hey, your range really depends on what your topography is and conditions and things along those lines. So. I think it's it's a good idea. It's another type of thing if this fits your need case scenario. I don't tend to bike in groups. Um, the only person I tend to bike with tends to be with MJ. So um, in that scenario, I could see it being something to maybe consider. But for those of you who do ride in groups and you can see a scenario where you would get separated or you just want to have something to be there in case it does happen, I think this is a nice bit of insurance in areas where you have low or no cell phone coverage. Um, like I said, four mile range, that's pretty good. Four miles is not a lot of distance, but you know, if someone's, you're going at relatively similar paces, but maybe one person is a little bit faster, they may only be a mile or two ahead of you. And that would be kind of a long ways ahead of you for any given day. It just sort of depends. I think it's a nice bit of insurance, as I mentioned, and something to go check out. Now, again, this is not something that I'm probably going to be getting, but I thought I would raise it in the gear talk section in case this fits any of your needs. So you can go check out this one. It's gotenna.com. I know there are other products that are out there that are available that might fit your needs if you want some other way of getting connected. Of course, you could go a little bit lower tech and just go with walkie talkies and things like that. Those are certainly up there as well, but uh, go check it out. Um, This one was very interesting to me. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net. Lots of great content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregator, Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his debut album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Habitat, wherever cool music is available. <laughs>